In this series I go bit by bit through the Lord of the Rings films in the extended edition and try to explain all references and differences to the books I can find in detail. In addition I try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it. Also before we start a little reminder, I now have a discord server, feel free to join. I'm also streaming on Twitch again after this episode releases. Links are in the description. But let's start. Brie has always been a fascinating place for me. It has this romantic adventure feeling that I often think about when I play fantasy tabletop RPGs. In those your characters often end up in the tavern, drinking ale, looking for opportunities, people or both. While loud laughter halls through the room, filled with the warm light of the fireplace and candles, seemingly pushing both your problems and the troubles of the world away, at least for now. In The Lord of the Rings this feeling appears when the hobbits are standing in front of the prancing pony. Even though all the big houses seemed a bit weird for Sam and the four hobbits try to be very careful but when they go inside their cautiousness seems to slowly decrease over time. On the sign above the entrance we see a white pony on its hind legs which is described in the book too. I really love this shot of the sign in the film. Still there are small differences. In the book we find the white letters Francing Pony by Barleyman Butterbur over the door and not on the sign but still it's pretty close and makes totally sense for the shot. Another example of how well they capture the essence of the chapters and made it work in film. Last episode we stopped at the four hobbits talking to Mr. Butterbur, the innkeeper, who seemed to remember something. The book and film have some differences here. Of course Frodo introducing himself as Mr. Underhill is in the book too, but after that we will see some differences. However the film also plays a bit with expectations if you know the book. In the film the innkeeper Butterbur repeats the name Underhill as if he would remember something, but then they ask for Gandalf and he flat out says no, haven't seen him in six months. In the book the name Gandalf isn't dropped immediately but Butterbur also tries to remember something when he hears the name Underhill but can't. Frodo is a bit suspicious and if he would have said Gandalf Butterbur would have most likely remembered what it was. We come to this in a moment, so again some differences but also some references. Then we see some shots of the people in the prancing pony and the hobbits eating at a table. In the book they were led into a separated parlor to have supper and Nob, he and Bob were the two hobbits working for Butterbur, showed them their bedrooms. He and Butterbur also served the supper and invited the hobbits to join the company in the common room. This part was removed in the film and the hobbits stayed in the common room almost all the time. Also Merry warns his friends to be careful on what they say to others. He also wants to go a bit outside. Pippin also asks Merry to not go too far away from the inn because it's not safe. So both act more mature than they would in the film, at least to some degree. So Merry stays back and later goes a bit outside. Frodo, Sam and Pippin decide to join the company and enter the common room. While Strider sitting in a dark corner is straight out of the book, the crowd of the inn seems far more mixed in the text. There's a dwarf company and hobbits are mentioned among several men, even some from the south. The film scenes work a lot with people on stilts and they use a scaled up rebuild, so a giant version of the set, also scale doubles in some scenes to create this illusion. They put quite some effort into this. I think here we also see someone who could be a hobbit and this guy in the background could be a dwarf. In the bronzing pony scenes from the hobbit films the different peoples are easier to recognize. The company in the inn is pleased to see the hobbits and even welcomes them while Butterbur introduced them. Some suspicious men seem to observe the hobbits which is also mentioned in the book too. One of them is a guy called Bill Fernie. We come back to him later. The people are curious about news from the Shire from where they have rarely visited these days. And so the three hobbits begin to have conversations and drink some ale. The Bree hobbits also have some underhills among them and think that Frodo is a long lost cousin. However it becomes quite difficult for Frodo to make up a background story for Mr. Underhill on the fly. Also he is asked what he does and he explains that he is interested in the history and geography of the area 
area because he writes a book about it, which brings the people to tell him all kinds of stories. But when he does not start writing down notes or writing his book right on the spot, people lose a bit interest in him. We see this hinted in the film with Pippin talking to all kinds of people, while Frodo and Sam are a bit isolated. In the book, Frodo, Sam and Pippin all talk to people and Merry is missing from these scenes completely because he is outside. So the pint dialogue is for example not in the book, but it indicates that Merry knows Bree and the bronzing pony, at least a bit, which is the case in the book too. So Pippin tells some funny stories from the Shire and many people start listening to him. We see this in the film too. Then we have the scene where Frodo notices a figure with a hood sitting in a dark corner, smoking a strange long stemmed pipe. A hood overshadowed his face. Only the gleam of his eyes could be seen watching the hobbits. Frodo asks Butterbur who he is without looking. He says he comes here infrequent. Sometimes you see him often and sometimes he's not seen in months. He is one of the rangers. His name is not known but people call him Strider here and the people of Bree find the rangers suspicious. This scene in particular was adapted so well in the film. It's really like seeing the book coming to life. The follow up is however a bit different. In the book Strider asks Frodo to come to his table and they have a brief talk. Both book and film play a bit with if Strider can be trusted. They manage to subtle hint at that Strider must be a good guy over a short time, but I think they do this fairly well. Strider warns Frodo that his young friend, meaning Pippin, is talking too much. Frodo got alarmed too, as Pippin started to talk about Bilbo's birthday party. The last thing he wanted was that the name Baggins was said aloud. Now you may think that the book continues as it does in the film, but no, both have a lot of differences in the following scenes. To get the attention away from Pippin, Frodo climbs on a table making a speech, quite similar to the speech scene with Bilbo at his party. He also plays with the one ring in his pocket while doing so. We see this referenced in the film with Frodo playing with the ring while sitting at the table as it would call to him. Suddenly someone shouted song and Frodo sung a song he learned from Bilbo where a tavern is mentioned in and people started singing with him, even asking to sing it again and providing him some ale. It was a huge success, people were jolly and Frodo successfully distracted from Pippin's story. It's reminiscent of the scene in the Green Dragon Inn from the Shire. It's quite funny that actually Frodo is dancing and singing on the table and not the troublemakers Merry and Pippin. You can also find the lyrics in the book. There's also another reference, maybe a bit far-fetched. Sam asks after they say goodbye to Tom Bombadil earlier before entering Bree if the prancing pony is like the Green Dragon Inn, which Merry answers to, hinting that he knows the inn as mentioned earlier. So also the books establish a connection here. However, there is the line in the song The Cow Jumped Over the Moon, where Frodo also jumped up on the table but tripped and fell down, breaking some marks to the laughter of the crowd. But when he landed on the floor, he just vanished because he accidentally put on the one ring while hitting the floor, to the shock of everyone in the room. In the film we also see Frodo fall, but the circumstances are very different. He trips over the feet of someone while trying to stop Pippin from talking too much. Still, it makes sense from my perspective, especially considering that they had to cut down the brief part a lot for the film. For a visual medium it also makes sense to move the ring from his pocket into the air. It has something forced by fate you could say and visualizes this quite well. Even in the books Frodo explains that he does not know how the ring got on his finger and that it maybe happened because it wanted to be found. I think this scene catches this quite well because it feels so unnatural like a higher power wants this outcome. It also shows the power of the one ring and how it tries to cause problems so it can be found by his master's servants, which is actually a threat for the hobbit's lives. 
The film also has an interesting detail in the scene where Frodo plays with the ring in his hands. You see that he seems to bite his fingernails, which makes him quite human and you think maybe this is due to the struggle with the one ring. But Elijah Wood was actually a nail biter and Sir Ian McKellen also commented on it that it was brave of him to show this. For example, he could have asked for a finger jubel. He later managed to stop with his habit after Return of the King ad because he hated seeing his nails on screen. Still, it actually adds to the character of Frodo Baggins in my opinion. So after falling down, Frodo became invisible or he was moved to the so-called unseen to be precise, the part of the world that is hidden for most eyes. Only powerful spirit beings like Sauron or powerful elves who have seen the light of the two trees of Valinor and let's say are still filled with it could see the unseen. I really like the effect of the films for the unseen world and that they bother to show it, which also hints at the fundamental concept of it for people who don't know the law so well. Through this visualization effort, it is indicated that it's not a magic trick making the wearer transparent or bending the light around his body. He is moved into a different aspect of reality, that is the unseen or wraith world. Of course, it's still magical, but more interesting this way and has at least some answers and some plausibility inside a fantasy world. I made a video about magic in The Lord of the Rings which explains this a bit in case you are interested. In the film Frodo sees the fiery red eye of the Dark Lord Sauron. This is not in the book. Also the Nazgul become aware of him and try to breathe which isn't mentioned explicitly but it's implied. The books mention an eye of Sauron which is also on its banners or a gaze that watches the ring bearer but it's not that explicit and often feels more metaphorically used in the book. Of course film as visual medium had to show something and visualize it. Sauron in the books is not much described or even seen. It's difficult for a story in film to have an antagonist who is never shown so they saw the need for at least some kind of symbol that appears to represent him and I think many people like the idea. The fiery eye has become very iconic and it works well for the films. When I make videos I often have the problem too that I don't have a picture of someone or something. So I need to find a way to still visualize it somehow. Think of the iguana in the dragons video. It is needed. So as someone who uses this medium as well I can totally understand why they did this. However, after fearing the eye and the voice of Sauron, Frodo takes off the one ring. I really like the Nazgul shots riding through the night by the way. A really cool scene and the second time where the danger of the ring truly becomes reality for the hobbits. In the book there's nothing of this. People were just shocked and even upset. Also the suspicious looking guy called Bill Fernie leaves with another strange guy. A squint eyed southerner. Both whispered during the evening looking at the hobbits. No clue who the squint eyed guy might be in this crowd. Either this one or that guy I guess. In the card game it's the guy with the mug. In the book he is probably from Duneland and potentially a half orc which is not represented in the film at at all. He's a trusted man of Saruman and together with Bill Fernie, who is probably also working together with the gatekeeper named Harry Goatleaf, they are selling information to the Nazgul. As said in the last video, we have a small conspiracy going on in Bree and Bill Fernie seems to be the local leader. Frodo in the meantime crawled invisible to Strider and took the ring from his finger. The crowd was speculating in shock what happened. They were not amused and discussed with Butterbur. Strider now asks Frodo why he did that and also hints at the ring, seemingly knowing about it which makes Frodo suspicious. He even calls him Mr. Baggins which Frodo ignores. The mysterious man also wants to have a quiet word with him when the situation cooled down a bit. Frodo knew how dangerous the situation has become for him now. 
The Hobbit agreed and went to the crowd, trying to deliver some kind of explanation that he just crawled under the table and then having a few words with Strider, which is suspicious in of itself, because the mysterious rangers were not very popular in Bree. The people were not pleased with his explanation, slowly leaving the inn until only the Hobbits and Strider were left, not even saying goodnight to the Hobbits. This would be a topic for conversations in Bree for quite some time and a disaster for the Hobbits. The enemy knows now where they are and that a Frodo Underhill, who is probably the Baggins they are searching for, has the ring. The Hobbits have a brief talk with Butterbur, who has said that all customers went home, but now he finally remembered what he has forgotten. They go back into the parlor and Strider follows them, unnoticed, which is quite impressive and shows just how skilled he is, but also why people fear him and the rangers. Only when the Hobbits put some locks into the fire, they notice him sitting in the corner of the room again. Pippin greets him and asks who he is. This is all very different in the film. Here Strider grabs Frodo after he becomes visible again and brings him upstairs into a room to probably protect him and have a conversation. We see a scale double of Frodo here on the stairs. Then Sam, Merry and Pippin kick in the door and confront Strider. According to Sean Astin, Sam's actor, his performance in this scene was so good it actually made Viggo Mortensen, the actor of Aragorn, a bit nervous for a moment. Not sure if this is true, but I can imagine he really nailed it. It was also Elijah Wood's 18th birthday and he was the youngest of the four hobbits with Billy Boyd, who played Pippin, the youngest hobbit in the story, being the oldest. He was 30 at this time. However, Aragorn draws his sword in this scene, which is another difference to the book, where he draws it much later in the conversation to introduce himself as Aragorn with the words, but the time is near when it shall be forged anew. And of course, in the book, it's not any sword he draws, it's Narsil, the sword of Elendil that broke when he threw down Sauron, perishing in the process, so Isildur could cut off the finger with one ring. In the film, it's just a long sword and Narsil is stored in Rivendell where Aragorn also grew up. It's a very interesting idea that the One Ring meets this sword again in this situation in some bedroom in a small village. This sword is the reason why the ring is not with Sauron anymore and part of his later downfall, a fateful moment. Peter Jackson said they really wanted to include Narsil for the scene, but he and his team could not make it work and it would require more explanation which he could not implement in this scene. It also did not look good almost a bit funny. So in the film we learn about it later in Rivendell and they changed this to a normal longsword for this scene. Hard to say if this could have worked. I think a mysterious guy with a broken sword is pretty interesting. Still, in the film they play a bit more with if Aragorn can be trusted. In the book it becomes pretty clear earlier due to an element that is missing completely in the film. We come to this in a moment. But step by step, so in the book all is different. As mentioned, Aragorn secretly follows the hobbits. They notice him and have a conversation in which several things are explained and become clear. He offers the hobbits to guide them. He also explains that he knows the Black Riders, which is later referenced in the film too, that they also came to Bree a few days ago and that he is their only chance to get to Rivendell. So he even knows where they are going. But not only that, he even reveals that he heard the conversation with Tom Bombadil and that Frodo will not use the name Baggins during their journey and is Mr. Underhill from now on. Aragorn calls Tom Old Bombadil, so it implies that he has some knowledge about him too. Still, no mention of Gandalf. He also later reveals that Gildor, the leader of the elvish company the hobbits met in the Shire, who saved them from the Nazgul, spoke with him too. I really like how he seems to be connected to so many people the hobbits met. It is also in this conversation where it's revealed in the book who the dark figure was that climbed over the wall after the hobbits passed the gatekeeper in Bree. Strider observed the hobbits for quite some time, even when they were talking to Tom Bombadil, and followed them unnoticed until this point, which really shows what a boss he is. 
Even though he is only a man, considering all this, it feels like he's some powerful entity that can move in the shadows. As Gandalf said, Aragorn, the greatest traveler and huntsman of this age of the world. He also tells the hobbits about Bill Fernie and his men, who, as mentioned, were visited by the Nazgul some days ago and would sell information to them, but he also explains that Butterbur is not involved in this and that he would have stopped them to join the company in the common room, but Butterbur would not let him talk to the hobbits in the parlor. Now Butterbur, who Frodo suspected to be part of the conspiracy, enters and apologizes. As mentioned, he remembered what he had forgotten. And now we come to the element that explains why Aragorn must be a friend, but is missing in the film. Butterbur had indeed talked to Gandalf three months ago, not six as stated in the film, and Gandalf gave him a letter that he should send to Frodo, but he forgot to do so. He hands over the letter and it recommends Frodo to leave the Shire at the end of July latest. It was September now, almost October, the 29th of September to be precise, which is really bad news for the Hobbits and if Butterbur would have sent the letter in time, they would be in Rivendale by now, not having the Nazgul at their heels. The letter also mentions Strider and even reveals his true name, Aragorn. Gandalf also says to make sure it's a real Strider. In addition, there are some mysterious sentences or hints which start to make sense when Strider introduces himself. Aragorn, as if he could read their minds, references or even quotes several of them and some of the dialogue we also find in the film. One of my favorites is when Frodo says, I think one of his spies would, well, seem fairer and feel fouler, to which Aragorn laughs and says, I look foul and feel fair, is that it? All that is gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. This references the first line of the letter, a really cool dialogue. In the film this was moved to when the hobbits leave Bree with Strider. I said that things become clearer and the letter is one part of it. Another is that Aragorn also explains if he wanted to betray or kill the hobbits they would be already dead and he proved this by just suddenly sitting in their room and having knowledge of their secret conversations outside of Bree, which is a pretty convincing argument and the hobbits can be pretty sure that this is the real Strider. Frodo also expressed, I believe that you were a friend before the letter came or at least I wished to. I can really recommend reading these chapters. It was a lot of fun rereading them multiple times for my research. However, a few things are still missing in the Brie part. For example, Mary, but we will discuss those in the next episode. Thank you for watching. Again, I want to hint at the Discord server for this channel. Everyone can join and we are discussing how to name some cosmetic server roles right now. If you hurry, you can still vote on it. I will also stream on Twitch for some hours shortly after uploading this episode. Feel free to chat a bit with me and leave a follow. For people who don't know, streaming is just a small side project for me and I hope the sound is better this time. This episode was a lot tougher to make than I planned it to be. I was not happy with my text so I had to rewrite many parts again while doing the voice recording, which took forever too. I still think it worked out in the end. I also plan to leave Brie in this episode, but there are still some more details I want to talk about, so I decided to end the video here. I hope you still enjoyed it. If so, press the like button and leave a comment. I read and answer almost everything. In case you are still listening and want to subscribe, consider pressing the stupid bell for notifications. Next video will be law related I guess. I maybe continue the series or find another interesting topic. If there are bigger news of the planned Amazon Lord of the Rings related series, I will make a video about this. Right now there's the rumor that the British actor Will Poulter was cast for it, which is not a bad choice. Some see a young Elrond in him, but we will see. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.